Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Friday Podcast brought to you by Outlier Venture. Today, uh, we're going to talk about games, Web3, and of course, and, and the regulation that applies to the game industry. I'm not alone, uh, lucky for us. I have with me Omri, who um, is our senior associate from the legal team uh, at Hovi. He has spent quite a bit of time actually on, on the game regulation and uh, has first-hand experience with Web3 games. He navigates the landscape in different jurisdictions. And so it's, it's really a pleasure to have you, Omri. And maybe before jumping uh, into the episode, if you you could give us a couple of insights how you ended up uh, to work here at OV. 100%. Thanks for having me, Lorenzo, first of all. So I'm part of the legal team at OV, and I joined actually quite recently. Before joining OV, I was you know, working as a lawyer in a law firm, and the, the law firm I, I used to work at, which is called Sheridan's, is in London, uh, has a very strong practice within video games. So in 2021, 2022, 2023, I'd say, and also more recently, you know, as Web3 game became, uh, started to develop further, you know, and receive more investment, I've worked uh, with quite a lot of projects on Web3 regulation. So it's great to be here to speak about that also because I'm a gamer myself, so I love the topic. And uh, yeah, I've been working, other than that, I'd say I've been working in blockchain for about six years. And uh, yeah. I look forward to continuing that for a long time, Etovi. Nice, nice. Thank you, Omre. So let's dive in here. And I think like recently we heard this news that Sorare has been sued by the UK uh, Gambling Commission. It's interesting that they are suing Sorare not because it's a security, uh, but actually here the issue is uh, there are some gambling concerns. And so I think what is interesting here is like, is gambling regulation starting to basically kick in and, and be relevant also for Web3 project as it was previously the security regulation or like the sector probably adapted to avoid to have a security regulation issues. But what about basically gambling concerns, Omri? What are your views on, on this? Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, you said it right because of, mostly I would say because of the, uh, the behavior of regulators, securities risk became very prominent. I'd say especially because of the SEC, but also because of other regulators. So everyone became quickly familiar with the risk that is involved you know, in crypto to the extent that it relates to securities. Gambling was a bit more silent. It's always been very uh, relevant you know, to crypto project, NFT project, especially. We can talk about that a bit later. And especially for you know, Web3 games. The problem is or at least was uh, also when I was in private practice in a legal firm advising clients, you know, when, when I'd flag that they'd be, oh, but how come Project X, Y, and Z are doing this and it's fine? You know, the fact that someone else is doing something, particularly in a in a new industry, does not necessarily mean that it's fine. It might all it might just mean that you know they have not yet faced the repercussion of, of doing that. That's so true. Eh? Sometimes you see influencer doing things and then 12 months later, well, that was an issue. They suffer the consequences of that, which is not something great, of course, but especially when you're advising a project, you know, and this is true in uh, the setting of a law firm, but also in an accelerator like ours, you flag risk. And of course, founders only have a certain buffer in terms of problem that they can address. And sometimes certain aspects can get can be neglected a little bit. And that was the case with gambling, but it's always been extremely relevant, although it has been hard to justify it, you know, especially because when you work as a lawyer in a law firm, clients pay for the advice. And so, and it can be expensive because it's incredibly complex. <clears throat> we can discuss that later uh, as we break down, you know, gambling law is applicable to this particular vertical, but it can get expensive, but it's something very important. And, you know, like every regulatory consideration, what I would say is that it's important to keep in mind that you might, as a project, you might not face issues immediately. And actually, you're more likely to face issues if you're very successful. So it's important to address these concerns at the beginning to avoid having skeletons in the wardrobe, you know, later on. And do you think here in with Sorare and 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 the gambling issues they are now facing in UK, by the way, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is is one of those cases or it's a bit more complex? I think this case is incredibly important because I mean, I'm of course I'm. <sighs> 
sad for Sorare if that's even, you know, it's not it's not a great news for the Web3 game space, but it could be a great news depending on how the case develops. What's going to happen, though, is that it's going to act as a stimulant. First of all, it's going to clarify the approach of the Gambling Commission, which is the regulator, at least in terms of enforcement. And, uh, you know, that's going to be important for the UK market, not only in terms of, you know, this is the regulation right now, and this is how we interpret it in, you know, as applicable to Web3 games, but broader than that, because then that could spark also some policy aspects that, you know, the regulator may want to consider. So I think yeah. it's important. We can expand on that later on after we discuss a bit more of the regulation. I think it would be good because then it gives more perspective to the listeners. Okay. Okay. No, I think it, it makes total sense. Uh, and I think uh, you already touched upon, but uh, is is not just uh, uh, gambling the issues that the project are are facing. I think I would be interested to learn and hear from you what are the other major legal and regulatory areas that basically the Web three game projects need to navigate or at least uh, keep in their mind as you were yeah. saying earlier. Yeah, yeah, and it's a very interesting topic. You know, when it comes to Web3 game, if you want, there is an added layer of complexity when it comes to regulation. Crypto project and blockchain-based project tend to be complex because they converge different areas of law uh, and regulation. Because as technology converges, right now we have technology and economy coming together thanks to blockchain then you start to look at, okay, laws that are relevant to tech as well as laws that are relevant to financial services. When you look at Web3 games, you have an added layer, which is that of games and gaming. So I would say that by default, you know, at least those are the areas that I would always cover in uh, an opinion for clients, in a legal opinion for clients, would be anti-money laundering, financial services, financial promotion, which is very relevant in the UK, but any sort of promotional activity that involves, you know, tokens or blockchain-based products, and of course, game uh, gambling, as we, as we just discussed. Okay, makes sense. And I mean, we can maybe start to dive in uh, e each of those, but it's interesting, I think, to me always, the um, AML, so the anti-money laundering uh, uh, regulation, because it's normally associated with the exchanges or financial services. So when you yeah. start with games, it's not necessarily your first link. Can you maybe try to explain a bit more why this is so relevant for the Web3 games and maybe when it kicks in? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I see why the... It's not immediate, you know, why you would say, well, but why do I need to consider AML? Truth is, and, you know, just as a uh, to preface everything we're going to discuss, my experience mostly relate to the UK, but I think it can it's a good starting point also to look at other um, jurisdictions in Europe, you know, the, the US. Uh, the US, of course, it's uh, particular, when it, especially with respect to securities. But in terms of anti-money laundering, a Web3 game normally incorporates tokens of some form, right? So you're going to have issuing activities, for example, the first issuance of tokens that could potentially trigger uh, anti-money laundering obligations. For example, in the UK, issuing token falls within what is called as an exchange activity, which is covered under anti-money laundering and requires issuers to register with the Financial Conduct Authority, which is the regulator in the UK. So it's quite bur uh, burdenous. The regulatory scope of AML right now, it's more limited, I would say, than gambling and financial services. So what we've seen as a trend is, you know, projects setting up separate structure in, you know, in other jurisdictions and then issuing tokens from there to avoid having to register, for example, in the UK. And it's an accepted practice. It's not like they're trying to avoid, you know, tax or anything like that. Actually, they're, they're paying taxes through services agreement, but that's, that's uh, too technical probably. But the important thing to, to understand is that broadly the categories under anti-money laundering right now as applicable to crypto assets are exchange activities and custody services. Exchange activities is quite broad and it includes issuance, but it could also cover, of course, something as predictable as an exchange, right? People go on an exchange, they buy and trade uh, different classes of assets. But the ability to trade in-game items within a game could in itself amount to an exchange. Because if you're looking at it, if you remove the form and you focus on the, on what it is exactly, there could be a, an exchange of cryptographic assets, you know? So that's why anti-money laundering is particularly relevant. And also to note, anti-money laundering was really, I would say, the first area that was dealt with in terms of crypto regulation in the UK that was dedicated to crypto. Because when it came to when it comes to financial services, we have guidance, but truth is we already have those. 
regulation in place. And so it's about interpreting them in light of crypto. I think it's interesting, like maybe to do a parallel uh, between like the tradability and the collectible. No, like we already had that a lot in the previous cycles. And I think the anti-money laundering was not that obvious back in the days. And also compared to probably other industries no, where you already have collectibles uh, that they are traded and I always laugh about the, the Pokemon cards, but also yeah. stamps or Magic the Gatherings. There are actually a huge industries of collectibles. So is that like the regulator applying a different receipt uh, to different uh, sectors? Is, is like crypto in the eye of the storm ends more attention or actually also in the other sectors there is this attention uh, when there is tradability uh, of, of the collectible. Yeah. I know it's a very broad question depending on the jurisdiction, so I don't want to uh, put it is, you It is a trick question. Here we go, Lorenzo. You're yeah, trying to spread it know, right on the game. Putting you no, in, but, in difficulty. No, so what I would say is that even when you're looking at uh, trading of collectibles, anti-money laundering is likely to be there in terms of like as a... As a as an area that is dealt with, but it might occur at a different stage. So, for example, when you're buying and sell collectible online, you normally do that using, you know, a credit card or a debit card. So perhaps it's positioned in a, a at a different stage of the chain, let's say, of, of uh, you know, the transaction. But you still normally have that, right? You're using a credit card or a debit card, which is uh, issued by a bank. The bank has run anti-money laundering check on you before, you know, welcoming you as a client. So there are protections in place. The problem with crypto is that you're dealing with a potentially a completely separate frame, uh, you know, economical framework and financial framework where nobody's validating me. All I need is a wallet with, you know, a firm of currency that say is compatible within a game or even outside of games, you know, just when we look at crypto in general, and I can immediately exchange value, accept value, uh, enter and exit a transaction fairly quickly. So that's why I would say from a speculative standpoint, government and you know had to had to implement dedicated frameworks to regulate anti-money laundering within the context of crypto because you know the the basic premise of Bitcoin and what everyone was very excited in the early days was this uh, no need for intermediaries. No need for intermediaries means that someone, you know, if we want to carry on with anti-money laundering check being a standard, we need to place it at some point. We need to give the responsibility to someone. So that's, I would say, like why we find ourselves in this current framework. But then as a Web3 games, couldn't mm -hmm. be like uh, possible to think that basically I'm just uh, providing the items, I'm not providing uh, the payment system. So it's basically happening uh, outside uh, my... Yeah. Uh, game itself. So there is a value, but it's not because it's uh, yeah. tradable that I am responsible for the people that they do. I see what you mean. In that case, you know, you would have, if you are the game provider and you issue the item, then the issuing activity might fall under anti-money laundering. If that is not the case, you know, we, we discussed in-game trading of crypto assets. So in that case, you're probably creating a protocol for the exchange. You're either creating or you're otherwise incorporating in your game the protocol for the exchange of in-game assets. So I would say that those are positive steps on the part of the game provider. That's what would trigger, I would say, the the responsibility. Whether anti-money laundering is an effective framework, as is you know, today to prevent money laundering, that's a completely separate Yeah, we can do an episode. You know? uh, I think there is a lot there. Uh, but fair enough. So maybe like we already touched upon that while we're talking, but in terms of like the uh, securities uh, risks we, we could have, like what are the game mechanics or, or token feature that basically are the one that could uh, trigger the, the securities regulation concerns when we are uh, designing and building a game. Yeah. So, you know, when you're looking at tokens and uh, considering, you know, the regulatory profile from a financial services perspective, what you're trying to understand is, does this token look like a regulated instrument? Like, for example, does it look like a share in a company? So does it entitle the holder to dividends of an entity or governance over an entity or ownership of an as over an asset, right? 
<clears throat> so you're trying to understand what are the rights that are associated with the token. When we look at Web3 games, normally what I would say is if there is a reward that a player gets simply by virtue of holding the asset, okay? So I'm telling you, for example, Lorenzo, buy these characters, you're going to get X amount of tokens every three months. That looks like an investment. So it you know, very high level because it can get very extremely technical. In terms of like high level bird eye view, if something looks like an investment, it probably is. You know, so this is the, the this is distinct and different from rewards that you get as a player for performing certain actions okay. or for providing certain services or for contributing. You you see how it's different because now suddenly it's not I hold this asset, therefore I'm entitled to reward, it is I am performing a certain task that contributes, let's say, to the game, therefore I'm receiving a reward for that. And there are degrees, of course, you know, and, and one of the fears that every lawyer has whenever they speak about this thing is that someone is going to listen to this and be like, okay, got it. I know how to design the game. I'm fine. And they, they, they end up in troubles because it's more complex. But to give a high level perspective, normally you want rewards to result from services or from contributions that the sort of framework that you want to establish so if we look at and a good example of this is staking you know which is popular in many web3 games when we talk about staking i think when people talk about staking there are different understandings as to what staking you know is all about like for example before ethereum moved to proof of stake and was still on proof of work you had all of this project talking about proof like about you know, uh, oh, there is a staking mechanic, but in reality, there was no contribution to the network. So, you know, when when you're talking about staking within a proof of stake, you can design it so that upon the gathering of a certain amount of tokens, you then start to contribute to the network as a, for example, as a validator or like uh, you start to partially operate the network. That is a contribution. When instead staking is simply an artificial mechanic that uh, allows you know holders to lock up the tokens to you know increase scarcity and hopefully increase the value of the token and in exchange for that they receive more tokens you know where is the contribution there it becomes yeah. harder to prove so of features that could potentially bring financial services in the conversation another type which is less obvious and it's more subtle it's electronic money so e-money tokens can also amount to e-money e-money effectively you know, like to, to give a simple definition, is electronic money that give the ability to its holder to be claimed against real money. So you can think about, for example, you go on Revolut, right? You look at the application, you deposit 10 pounds, or suddenly I have 10 pounds credit, right? On, on my account on Revolut. But I can withdraw them at any time. So there is a claim against the issuer of that electronic value. Tokens can can be similar to that, especially stable coins are at risk, I would say, because of course I'm putting money in, I'm given a cryptographic asset that represent a certain value, and I normally have a claim against the issuer. And you encounter that in game, also not necessarily in the form of crypto assets, but just like you know, when 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 project try to overcome the issues and challenges within crypto assets, they say, okay, I'm just creating an in-game currency. The problem is if you allow players to exit that currency, you know, and so if there is a claim against the issuer, then you run potentially into electronic money problem, which is, you know, a type of financial service and, and is regulated. So that's another risk to to be mindful yeah. of. I think like here, the the big aspect is probably the jurisdictions that depending where you are setting up, uh, it changes greatly the, the approaches. But it's also true that if you want to tackle certain type of geographies, uh, then you need to basically find a way through the regulators. And coming back to what is happening right now to Sorare is because basically they interacted with, with UK. They started to sponsor the, the Premier League, and that's uh, what triggered the, the attention of, of the regulator. So as long as you do not operate in certain geography, uh, the, the constraints can be very different. But at the same time, while you are doing the designing, uh, you should maybe uh, try to incorporate some principles uh, that then uh, allow you to uh, navigate in a simpler way uh, down the road, uh, the different type of, of jurisdiction you could uh, uh, yeah. encounter. 
you bring a very a very good and a very interesting point, which is you know jurisdiction. Some regulation applies to you if you carry out an activity from the jurisdiction. This is the case of AML in the UK as applicable to crypto. Other type of regulation applies to you if you offer the services into that jurisdiction. So that's known as you know extraterritorial scope, which is the case of financial services, gambling and financial promotion. What I would say is that when you look at financial services, what is a security, e-money tokens, you know, like what we've been discussing, that tends to be more harmonized, meaning the rules that apply in that particular respect tend to be more consistent across a wide number of jurisdictions. The main reason for that really is that it stems from the EU, most of it, even after Brexit, you know, as, as of course we move further along from Brexit, then the UK is likely to defer in some respect, but it still originates from there. But if you look at gambling or if you look at anti-money laundering, for example, as as related to crypto, to cryptographic assets, then those are her, uh, areas where there is little harmonization for now. Of course, in the EU now you have uh, Mika, which is, of course, which does bring some, some degree of harmonization. But if you look at gambling, it's very disjointed. Like in some jurisdiction, it's illegal. In some, straight out. You cannot get a license. You cannot offer gambling services. So while we're talking about gambling and, and regulation, I think uh, as we earlier, we were discussing about the risks of being seen as a, as a securities. Maybe we can try to dig into the, the specificity of the game mechanics that can actually bring uh, that uh, game in the scope of the gambling laws and like there is a lot of mechanics that basically trigger that angle can you maybe give a couple of examples from your perspective now uh, as a lawyer you now when you see something that basically is increasing the chance to have an issue yeah so in the uk gambling is defined as three types of activities you have lotteries which are effectively arrangement where participation require payment so pay to enter where prizes are distributed uh, through chance, through an, um, an element of chance, you can think about the lotteries, you know, like the loot box, there, there is, uh, prices are distributed through, through chance. And what's interesting here is that pay to enter also c could be viewed, you know, could be interpreted, at least that's how I used to interpret it um, when advising clients. If you require NFTs to participate to a game, if you say the game is the arrangement and prices are allocated based on chance, then could potentially, I think that could satisfy the requirements for it to be being considered a lottery and so as a, as a gambling activity. You could also stretch it, technically speaking, to a point where any NFT collection that has, you know, randomized traits can fall within this meaning because there is a pay to enter, even the minting price, right? Then there is an element of chance and prices are distributed. So... I think because of the pace of the gambling commission, it would be difficult for it to argue now, three years after the NFT boom, that, you know, that's a lottery and everyone that carried it out was acting illegally. You know, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. There are some counter arguments, although I don't think they're particularly strong. For example, if you look at crypto punks, hoodie punks are very coveted, right? And, and, uh, and a lot of people love them and they have a high value high resale value. There are some trades that are more rare than hoodies, but they don't have the same premium attached to them. So rarity is not necessarily a bit of a legal, a bit of a weak legal argument, but you know, um, I think that, yeah. That, that so would basically be if it's, if there is an aspect of paying to enter, or there is like basically a game of chance that that is when, when it trigger. So a game of chance is different because this one we're talking about a an arrangement where prizes are distributed through a, a, a chance-driven system. The okay. game of skill comes into play in another type of gambling activity. So we look at lottery, right? So pay to enter, prizes are allocated to participants. And uh, by the way, prize is defined as um, money or money's worth. So crypto assets fall within the definition because money's worth is very broad. But for example, like if we have uh, games and they have uh, maps uh, and in those maps, there are like resources located and yeah. those resources are uh, distributed with like randomly, like mm -hmm. you could have different maps 
Uh, however, you need to basically go through those maps in order yeah. to find. And, and like, there is a mix of things. You know, like, I do believe there is these uh, random aspects, but at the same time, uh, would you see that? Uh, also, because I, I could find question. basically I, your I the crypto question. banks are super valuable. I, I love the question. And what I would say is that what you're talking about is a game. So lotteries are not really game. You could, you could think about it as uh, loot boxes you know, are a good example of that. There isn't really a game. You buy a loot box, you open it, you get prizes, right? Something like that. So you pay for the ticket, you you participate, and you might get a prize. The second type of activity, so gaming is relevant for the last of the activity, the last one. And I'll keep it for the last one because I think the dichotomy between game of chance and game of skill is very important to understand. And I think it would be useful for, you know, whoever Yeah, we're going to go there. Yeah, in a sec. Betting is, you know, as the second, uh, I would say, type of uh, uh, gambling activity under the in the UK, which is effectively risking something of value on uh, the outcome of an uncertain event. So you could think about that as prediction-based game, fantasy football. Depending on the mechanics, I bet that this team will win, right? So there is a wager, there is a risk of losing something on the outcome of an uncertain event. And then the last one, which I find is very interesting, is uh, gaming. So it's a uh, Yeah, it's called gaming. And it's defined as playing a game of chance for a prize. Now, this is interesting because it does not require payment, right? A lot of Web3 games think, okay, I'm going to remove the payment element from it and I'm safe. Gaming technically is defined as playing a game of chance for a prize. So what is a game of chance? A game of chance is, well, I can tell you what is not a game of chance, which is a game of skills. The problem with a game of skill, yeah. Maybe before we jump here, I think like... uh... That's interesting explanation, but could you also maybe add the angle like uh, from the regulator standpoint, you no, know, like how they're gonna determine you no know, between yeah. what is the game of chances versus the, yes. the game of skills. You no, know, like I think maybe we can first let's define the two different types and then in the eyes of the regulator mm-hmm. how uh, they judge them. Yeah. So a game of chance is a game which outcome depends on chance. A game of skill is a game where the outcome of the game is dictated by skills. But then, of course, games do not tend to be only chance, only skills. Like, you have some form of, you know, they tend to be in the gray. They tend to uh, fluctuate between these two extremes, right? You can think, for example, about Mario Kart, right? The competition. It's a game of skill to the extent that you need to know, you know, it's... um, uh, mechanical prowess, uh, high-end coordination, understanding of the game rules and applying the game rules to, to each session. At the same time, you also have power-ups, which are random, right? And uh, so there are some elements to it that are actually chance-driven. So what happened in those cases? Well, gambling regulation is quite strict because if you have a game of skills which still has some game of chance it would be deemed as a game of chance and not as game of skill okay it can which can be difficult one test that i was using let's say like you know when you advise project on this thing you try to come up with like some some blueprint or principle to explain to clients you know how they can try and and determine like small tests you know that are useful is if you repeat the game loop a high number of times is the outcome going to stay the same? So if, say, you and I are playing a Mario Kart, a Web3 version of Mario Kart, right, where we actually make money, like whoever wins, and uh, you are very strong and uh, I'm terrible at it, is there, and and we repeat the game loop, meaning we repeat the match a hundred times, a thousand times, is the element of chance sufficient to give me an opportunity to win? If the answer is no, I think that then there are strong uh, merits to, you know, justify that it is actually a game of skill. If the answer is yes, it becomes more difficult. Okay, interesting. In case of Mario Kart particularly, uh, it has been balanced quite well in terms of the chances and, and the skills. You, you want to take, a, as a Web3 pro, a game project, if you're relying on, you know, a, a game of skills to avoid falling within the regulatory scope, you really want to focus on taking chance out of the equation. So I've worked with some, you know, uh, game um, developers and publishers that to do that, for example, have the same type of power-up sequence, 
meaning you know first power up is same across everyone second power up say, same across everyone meaning that it's up to the player to skillfully perform in the game to secure the power ups but they won't have an unfair advantage compared to other players in terms of the power up they receive you know in terms of progression so those are some some examples of what what could be done yeah. And really, you, you might ask, well, but a lot of video games have chance within the game. That's what makes the game fun. Fair enough. But Web2 games do not have prizes, typically. So that's the difference. That's why they do not fall within regulatory scope. They can't extract the prize from the game, they can, which is not a prize from a gambling standpoint. But they, there is no extractability. Everything is confined within the game. There is a broader policy argument here to say if value only flows back to the publisher through you know microtransaction and whatnot and players are never in a position to be able to claim any money back you know to, to take anything back then that's fine but the moment that players have the opportunity to extract value very then, interesting I you know here, you're right. putting all of this barrier to me you know, it's a policy argument because I don't know if it's that much safer for children because I do think that loot boxes can in, can incur in, you know, exorbitant amount of expenses for parents as we are Yeah, yeah. I was thinking similar things here and it seems like as long as is uh, towards the service provider, you're just paying, but at the same time, the exchange uh, is is not allowed. I don't know if the regulation is fair here. Like, yeah, uh, it would be I think great there are actually. Are, yeah. If you could have a uh, claim back that money somehow, and that will make it fairer. But again, yeah. I think as before we were saying, like we need to face what is the regulation and try to comply to that while maybe in other venues we can try to, to change it. But let's, uh, uh, while we work, uh, we walk towards the, the end of our episode, like could we maybe summarize a bit, like what could be the, uh, steps that those Web3 games project can take to to mitigate the regulatory risk, mm -hmm. like maybe a couple of uh, tips that uh, as a uh, builder uh, in the space, I can take in, in my mind. And once again, like that, that's not legal advice, right? It's just yeah. like trying to navigate the directions. Yeah, exactly. So first of all, this is not legal advice, <laughs> you know, like f first statement everywhere. But what I would say is on the more practical side, please do engage a lawyer and please do engage an accountant. I know that it sounds boring. I know that it's expensive and I know that it's difficult, but it can make sense, especially because if you spend a lot of time developing a particular game mechanic or game experience and you realize at the end of having developed it that you cannot offer it, then all of that time and all of the resources that you have invested in developing it are effectively wasted. So I would say, you know, involve competent advisors early in the process, as early as you can. In terms of like, you know, take away from what we've discussed today, please consider on anti-money laundering risk, especially if you are implementing an uh, in-game trading system for cryptographic assets, including NFTs. Please make sure you look at financial services regulation. So give rewards based on completing quests. Give give rewards based on contributions that player make to the game, to, to, to the, to the game, the community. Please do not promise that, you know, by buying an NFT, people are going to make money uh, and uh, they're going to, you know, that it's going to be life-changing uh, or, or promise, you know, recurrent rewards simply by virtue of holding. If you implement staking, make sure that there is a true contribution to the network or like to, to the whole protocol. Please also, when you're looking at gambling risk, make sure you focus your mechanics around skills, around true skills. And, and to be honest with you, I think that by focusing on true skills, if done right, that can also attract the right type of player that you want. Because you don't want to build a community of traders, you want to build a community of players. There is an economy uh, of fun, right? Like we're producing yes. uh, something that has to be fun to play, otherwise it doesn't yeah. make any sense to have the game. Fun itself. and earned status, potentially. Because status, you know, we are coming from two, three years where digital assets have really allowed people to express status online, like digitally right? The type of NFT or PFP uh, profile picture that you use. A lot of that is not really earned. It's bought. Within a, a game gives you the ability to earn status. Like when, when I was playing World of Warcraft as a kid, Vanilla, and I know that you did as well, you know, when you saw some of the higher guild, like going around in that uh, fancy gear, 
it meant that they have cleared those raids. It meant that they've managed to organize themselves in a very large group and that they overcame overcame the challenge. It meant something, you know, within the game. If I can just buy it, you just defeat that, you know? Yeah, so that that I strongly agree. Like in the end, the games need to be balanced and need to be a, yeah. a proper game design. Okay, so I think we we cover a lot of ground here, and um, maybe we can try to to wrap up uh, mm-hmm. with uh, from from where we started. No, like we started with the the Sorare case in in UK. I think I would I would be interested to understand like what's happening right now and particularly compared to what we have in france with this uh Jonum regime mm-hmm. uh, where they are basically building a framework that is actually focused on crypto game as a target um can we basically expect something similar uh, happening in uk but in general in other regions so do we need that type of regulation to put together games and web3 i, I think we do because of, especially because of gambling risk see server I, I i look up to server because they really took this um regulatory hurdle on themselves they've driven the the establishment of the john regime which is as you mentioned you know a framework that w- that accommodate that is designed really around web3 games uh, to balance out gambling risk and you know the regulation that is dedicated to it and at the same time on the other hand you know they need not to stifle innovation which is an important thing here in the uk of course now we're seeing this case which is going to be crucial and very important to understand what is the view of the uk regulator in respect to you know web3 games and how is gambling applicable to them what i would say is that the regulator can be limited because at the end of the day, they need to enforce regulation. They are not lawmakers. So there is a broader policy argument that I hope this case will stimulate. Because if you look at the Web2 gaming industry, the UK is actually a leader and they've managed to do so also by investing in dedicated you know, legislation. For example, we have tax exemptions for video game, the video game tax relief, which is very attractive to game publisher and, ga- and game developers and bring projects to the UK a similar tax exemption applies also to movie production, which is also, you know, another factor that contributed to the growth of mu- movies productions here. So what I would say is that for the UK to continue to maintain this, this reputation, they should really start considering, you know, coming up with a framework that is inspired by the John regime. I, I'm not talking about the specific, I'm just saying like this effort to reconcile existing reg- regulation with this upcoming trend of Web3 games. So I think this case is going to be important to highlight that. And I think the more people speak about it, like we are doing, the more, of course, uh, chances there are to uh, catch the ear of uh, policymakers and, you know, to, to, to see something similar to what is happening um, in France here in the UK. Yeah, fantastic for that. Listen, this is it for our today episode of the Friday. We hope you enjoyed diving in the world of Web3 games and, and the regulations as well. Omri, thank you so much uh, for coming in and bring all those uh, insights. Please don't forget to subscribe to our uh, show and follow us on our social and stay updated on all the things Web3 related. And yeah, stay tuned for the next one. Have a good one. Thank you, Lorenzo. Have a good one, everyone. Please note, the content of this episode is for information purposes only and does not constitute legal or financial advice. For specific legal or financial guidance or concern, please consult a qualified professional. Thank you.